asking about what would, what can you do in addition to your TSP contribution? How do you move it from the TSP to oh, Roth IRA? Oh, how do you move it to the IRA? Oh, to, that's, a IRA. to a Roth IRA. To a Roth IRA. It is a, the law is very specific on this, on the Roth conversion. It's a two-step dance. Step one, you have to move it, and again, you have to be either retired or over age 59 and a half. Those are requirements. Otherwise, they cannot do this. But assuming that you are, one or the other, you have to first move it to an IRA. And then from the IRA, there are some very specific laws that guide this that are all in the Roth conversion text. You can get this on the IRS website. And then you do it by as much as you can afford to, because you have to pay taxes every time you convert. Okay? Now, there are some other safety valves that are on this as well. There's something called recharacterization, which means if you do too much, and on the Roth side, the market brings it down, you're obligated to pay taxes on all that sum that you just converted. The IRS is very forgiving. It's like going to Las Vegas, putting everything on the table, losing your hand, then asking the dealer, can I have it back, please? What do you think they're going to say? You lost it. But the IRS here, these are some of the gaps in this law. The IRS says you can recharacterize up until October 15th of the following year and call this null and void. So an example of that. Let's say you converted 100, let's say you took 400,000 from a TSD, rolled it over into an IRA outside, anywhere, okay? You've got 400,000 now sitting in the outside IRA. And you decide that you're going to convert $100,000, or all 400,000. Now, let's, let's say all 400, because we are gung-ho about this concept. And you convert it, now it's in a Roth, and then the market does terrible things to it. And the 400 has now become 200. And you're saying, what kind of advice is this? Because now I've got to pay taxes on 400. Let's say 30% of that, 120,000. But I only have 200 left. That's really bad. Well, first of all, you should not do this Roth conversion unless you're going to leave it for a very long time. So it, you have to bring in asset allocation at that time. And it has to be part of the overall plan as to can you really afford to leave this money for the longest time. By longest time, I mean at least 10 years. Not less than that. So if this is money that you're going to be depending on for your cash flow, okay, that is not a good idea. This is money that you, can, you have to leave alone. And again, we address that with the overall plan. That's one of the things that we would be able to do uh, if someone wants to complement the analysis as to how to go about and how to bucket it into different buckets. So let's say now you've done this. Now what you can do with recharacterization is bring the entire thing back to your IRA as if nothing happened. And then you're still good with the idea, reconvert. Now you pay taxes only on 200, not on the entire 400. You saved yourself 60,000 in taxes. Okay? Very significant. And then let it run, because over time, if the person that you're working with has done a proper job, asset allocation, you will not only get it back, but do a lot more. You know, as, as I tried to demonstrate from 1982 to 2012, lots of bumps on the road. But if you just hold it steady, you're going to do okay. But you did not, you canceled out. Yeah, you can't, you can't canceled out. Without your 120,000 of taxes, you only paid 60,000 now in the reconversion. So, if you don't sit around, you can save yourself $60,000. That's significant. 
And now, the opposite, the reason, and let me let, let, give you a little corollary to that, which is very interesting. And this is why people do this. You know, for instance, Roth conversion, you have that safety valve called recharacterization. That makes it very comfortable for people once you explain the concept to them. Because if you do that, let's take a year like 2013. 2008 is an example of what I said. Markets went down 38.6%, the C fund went down 38.6%, bad year, okay? Especially if you retire. Let's look at one of the better years, 2013. So let's say if you did this in 2000, or 2013, took your entire 400 and converted it to a Roth. The market gave you a 30% return. So now that 400 suddenly has become $520,000. And the extra 120, totally tax-free, forever. Therefore, you've got to beg, steal, or borrow to find that $120,000 of taxes that you have to pay on the 400, because that's very, very good. You know, the market gave you the money that you will eventually need to pay for taxes. Do you have a question to follow up on that? Is it possible to transfer, say you have a million dollar PSP, and you're thinking about the children, so you want to put 200000 of it to each of them. Is it possible to put sort of 400000 pay the taxes, into the Roth um, TSP, so it goes into a Roth TSP, mm -hmm. but then the rest of my TSP would still remain available for retirement, <coughs> or do we contaminate it by going? No. The, the question is, if I have a million-dollar TSP, and I would only like to move over into an IRA for possible Roth conversions, do I, do I do any harm to the 600 that's staying back? The answer is absolutely not. Okay, no, it's leaving it all in the TSP, but making the Roth TSP. You cannot do that. That's yeah, you can't possible. split the TSP into different accounts, is really, okay. and that's what you're asking. I got you. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're in this, yeah, we got to get out of that 600 level, I think. Get out of the 600 level classes, let's get back down to the 100. Mm -hmm. All you need to do is you need to establish an account with a broker or a bank, and then you fill, you fill out TSP 77 to do a partial distribution, or if you want to do a full distribution, it's TSP 70 is the form that you use to do it. Don't recommend you do. But then you're going to move it over, then you can do all the other stuff. But thinking about what I'm going to do a year from now, if I want to redo, I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about what's the process and the mechanics to go from A to B, and I want to lay out a sequential step, a process, a process process to get it done right. But then I've done what you said, which is narrowed my options on what I could do on so the TSP. That's exactly. You've okay. narrowed the options. I got it. Yeah. Got it. And that's why you move a third of it. Because if you move a third of it, now I've got of a million dollars. Yeah. Now I've got four hundred grand sitting over here that I can ebb and flow as I need to yeah. without affecting my TSP. And that's how I take care of my kids. That move that four hundred grand out. I establish a Roth with split beneficiaries. And then 200 goes to each child because there's two children. And you've done the huge benefit of paying the tax for your children. And folks, GB's right. Taxes are going up. That's the only place they can go. So what have you done? You've given the benefit to your kids in advance, and it's tax free. Um, I, I'd like to uh, clarify that the Roth
There's no income cap on conversion is the short answer. Okay. Thank you. My question is, if, if I have, um, if our prison has a, um, a traditional IRA um, outside of the TSP and it has both after-tax, uh, it has after-tax money in it and it also has earnings and it may have pre-tax money in it, I was told that you could basically, let's say it's half-half, so half of that money is after-tax and half of it is earnings. If you roll the earnings into your TSP, then you can convert the remaining, the after-tax contributions, into a Roth with no tax implications. You're, you're up in the 600 level courses too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, Excellent question. Yeah. But it, it's a great question. You can do it. Yeah. yeah, you bet. You want some additional? And I have one other question on the okay. Roth. If you if you have a, because um, we're now contributing to the TSP non-Roth, but with the if you contribute to the TSP Roth, the government does match. You still get your match? Or you yes, don't get yes, match? yes, you do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But in the first question that you asked, mm -hmm. uh, you've got to be a little bit careful about making sure that when you have done your taxes in the previous years, when you did the after tax contributions into your IRAs, mm -hmm. they better have been captured in a tax form called 8606. Yes, very, very important. Because that's the only form that the IRS will recognize as what was pre-tax and what was after-tax. If you don't have that, you know, IRS will say you've got to pay tax on the whole thing. What you can do is pay the IRS $50 for each previous year for tax return. And if it's substantial, do an amendment. Very, very important. That, it's well worth it. Most advisors do not want the headache, okay? Because it's a lot of paperwork and they'll get paid nothing. That's very important. We, you have to take care of the overall plans, and that's crucial. If you miss that, then you'll have problems with the IRS down the road. Another key caveat is we're talking about, again, some pretty complex stuff. And if we start talking about taking TSP money, moving it out, doing conversions, you have to keep in mind that when you do conversions, they're going to look at all of your IRA money. And so if you've got a bunch of traditional IRAs outside, you're opening yourself up to a real issue there. You've got to be very cautious. And also, I'm hoping that you're also familiar with the pro rata rule. The pro rata rule. No? The pro rata rule is crucial when you start doing, let's say you want to convert. The after-tax money goes to like, I really like what you said, which is if I push my pre-tax money back to the TSP, can I convert? There, there, that's one solution. An easier solution is to have a individual 401k set up. That's fairly simple. It's gonna be a lot easier than having to deal with TSP. That's much more complex. Just set up an individual 401k, move the pre-tax, but before you do the pre-tax money move, moved over, Got to make sure that you have your 8606s lined up properly, okay? Once you've done that, then the after-tax money can be moved to a Roth tax-free, and that's very important because if you continue to leave it in the after-tax IRAs, the gains and the increases are all becoming taxable. You want to avoid that, okay? So there are some little details uh, that most planners are not willing to take on unless they're very comfortable with the tax law. Correct. Absolutely. Good. Very good question. The question. Did everyone hear, hear the question? Okay. So it is. You're absolutely. This is where an analysis up front is very, very important because what that does, 
what the analysis will spell out, it's very easy for financial planners to do this to see what your cash flow is going to look like based on your pension, your anticipated social security, okay, your savings, your TSP, etc. So, a very common thing that happens with a lot of federal government people is when you combine the pension, the social security, and the required minimum distribution, very often the tax bracket is exactly the same as what you have been used to all your life. So that is a myth, is that you're going to be in a lower tax bracket. It does happen for some people, but the majority of the people do not see that. And what's even worse is that the way required minimum distribution is calculated, it gets, keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger every year. So for instance, at age 70, whatever your distribution is, let's say it's $30,000 or $10,000. At age 85, the factor goes from 27.4 to 14.8. So your distribution almost doubles. And this is a common problem. I hate to say this, the master is going to have this. Okay, because... Uh, so, so you will sit there and scream, I don't need this money. Why am I paying 30% in taxes? Because I would like to you know, save this. And that's what you need to do up front. That's what the analysis is that we were offering, uh, if you're interested, and sign up in the back of the table, because that will tell you, is this worthwhile for you? Are you a candidate for Roth conversion or not? If you are, then you need to start making the cures from now. Because time is of the essence. The more time you have, the more comfortable it's going to be, the conversion. But if it does point out, if the conversion point, if the analysis points out that you really are not going to have these tax issues based on cash flow analysis, then indeed what you're saying could be right. You may be in a lower tax bracket down the road. If you're a single person and you're saying, I have no legacy issues, that's a different case than if somebody who's got children and grandchildren and more money than they will ever spend in their lifetime. There, tax Roth conversion makes a lot of sense. So it's not a case-by-case -case basis. So an analysis up front to determine whether you're a candidate for this or not based on your goals and objectives, your financial standing, is very important. Can I just follow on? So if you have two federal retirements, yep. your income is counted together? Correct. Yep. Yes, and that, incidentally, you have two federal government employees that are married to each other, adds tremendous amount of flexibility to the planning process. It really opens up the planning vista. Do you have any comment on what you said? Let's make it simple. You put in 18 grand of TSP today. If you put it into the traditional TSP, it's going to cost you about 12,000 because the government's not going to charge you tax on the money you put in today, right? If you want to put it into the Roth, realize that it's going to cost you the other way. It's going to cost you 22000 this year to put that money in. There's a lot of considerations. One, what tax bracket am I in today? The assumption of what tax bracket you're going to be in at retirement, and for most of you, you also have to add in what are the odds the government has to raise taxes to handle $18 trillion. And I think when you begin to do that, it makes more sense to consider Roth as a, a proportional piece of your bucket. The other the other thing that I would say is that you you have to really look at income levels, and, and, and that is hands down one of the biggest things you need to consider. I have a general question for uh, Patrick Ortizzi. Can you address whether reverse mortgages should figure into uh, retirement planning or not? Okay. Do you want me to go first? I'll let you do that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You've been seeing all those ads by AAG, right? <laughs> Having more fun in retirement because now we don't have to pay a mortgage. The mortgage pays us. <laughs> so here's, here's how you can look at it. Reverse mortgages, okay? Uh, reverse mortgages have a taboo in our industry. People think of them as, as, as bad. Uh, 
So for some people who are in a cash flow crunch and are not able to pay their bills and may not have any legacy issues, single person, okay, who just wanted to have a good life and have better cash flow, they, and they are in a, in a cash flow crunch, they should look at reverse mortgage. It's not an evil thing. In general, for most people, it does not make sense if you have resources, because what you're doing, banks don't do. People, companies that do reverse mortgages are not doing it for charity. And they, so all they're doing, this is what is happening behind the, behind the scenes, is by doing a reverse mortgage, they have a method of calculating how much money can they give you every month until you die. You can live in the home as long as you live, okay? And then, when you pass away, they will give your beneficiaries the option of paying the bank back everything that was advanced and the interest that was you know, paid to you. And if your beneficiaries want to do that, they can, and then, and then repossess the home. But the way the calculations are done is if there is no beneficiary and nobody claims, or even if there are beneficiaries and they don't, they don't claim the home, the bank will make a very handsome profit. They're not doing it for, for charity. But the way it's is structured, if you're really in a cash flow crunch, instead of paying $2,000 every month, what if the bank is paying you $1,500 every year? Now you have a $3,500 swing per month in cash flow. Okay? So that's how the cash flow needs to be, be, be brought into play. And, and someone has to pay attention to the details and see is it really beneficial for you or not. And of course, your personal circumstances will, play, will weigh in heavily in making that decision. I tend to avoid them for a lot of cases because of the cost involved, but GB's right. I mean, obviously, if it's a cash flow issue for you, and it's the only way you're gonna make it through retirement, that's when we start exploring those kind of options. But for the average person who's got a decent pension and Social Security, the first objective is to live within your means. Um, I have a question. What, how many comments on it? Uh, historically, uh, historically, um, uh, people in retirement were encouraged to have paid off their mortgage before they retired. Um, if we assume that everybody in this room has refinanced regularly so that their interest rate on whatever mortgage they're paying is, we'll say, 4%. Okay, uh, I, I got it. And so I'll, I'll would you, you encourage someone right. to like take a partial withdrawal from TSP or whatever to I, pay it off? I, I, I've got it. I know exactly okay. what you're headed for. And, and I'll tell you what. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that was her. No, <laughs> but he's paying, paying right. Do you pay it off or do you keep it? Folks, there's two decisions here from my perspective. One's a financial decision and one's an emotional decision. Okay, the financial decision is, no, keep the mortgage, and because it's based on opportunity cost. If you've got a 3% loan, and you're getting a write-off for that, right? As currently legislated. And you're getting that write-off. So you're getting some of it back in taxes, so it's really only costing you 2.5%. If you can earn 5%, are you better off to keep earning 5 Absolutely. So that's the financial. Now I'll tell you the emotional. People come in to me and they say, I've got to pay my mortgage off before I go on retirement because I don't want any debt over my head. I'm never going to win on an emotional decision. So you have to make up your mind what is it? Is it a financial decision or is it an emotional decision? That's the one minute answer. Now I'll give it to GB. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think Patrick hit all that if you take more risk, you expect more return. But in this case, it's too close to call. So you have to see what can you confidently get in the stock market. Also, the duration for how long can you leave this. So you know the duration is very important. If you're only doing it for two or three years, not a good idea. Okay. No, I'm I work four, so I'm ready to wrap it up and have a beer. We're close to four, so we'll take one more question then, perhaps. Got it. <laughs> Just, if, 
Can we, we got the, each of us the opportunity to get one closing shot in here. Uh, folks, there's a lot of decisions to make. The stuff we talked about today is not advice for anybody. You've got to look at your situation. Every one of you is different. You're all unique. Nobody in here is in the same suit today. So we've all got to think about this on an individual basis. If you have questions, I always offer to do that for you. Uh, if you just shoot it to us at info at wealthcrest.com and one of us on the staff will answer your questions as best we can. We don't know an answer. We retain retired federal personnel as on staff that will answer your question for you. And you are in a very special system and it takes the right answers to make sure that you don't get bogus information. So reach out to us at info at Wealthcrest. If you sign up, we also do a newsletter. We send it out to you every month. I'm not gonna call you unless you say it's okay. And we send 2,000 of them a month. It comes with reminders about TSP, 1Cs, open season, things like that, as well as useful articles. So reach out to us, grab Ross, grab Greg, grab me on break. I, um, I think that's good advice. Uh, we, like Patrick's firm, uh, also are extremely planning driven. You know, we have, we have planners, they're not stockbrokers. So uh, we, would like to make a similar offer in the package that we gave you the one with the gold and the purple uh, there will be a sheet that you can look at at home when you go back uh, that gives you a sense of the the analysis that we would do it's complimentary there's no charge to you it's a two-step process we meet with you first for 45 minutes to gather some information about you and then the second step after we have done the proper analysis we give you a written report two reports and walk you through the analysis to basically address some of these questions that everybody has you know biggest question that we answer is am I okay can I afford to live for 90 years and so again thank you very much for coming and we really appreciate being included in this presentation Both of the presenters will have people in the back uh, that you can also sign up with just indicating your contact information so they can stay in touch if you'd like to. It's not on? Okay. Both of the presenters will have people that you can sign up with in the back. Now we'll need a little cooperation uh, because we'll be clearing out the room. So if you could move to the back or out to the vestibule or even outside for a few minutes while we remove the chairs and then we move into a chance for you to engage individually with people. And let's give them both another hand.